I'm going to talk about this problem of running large-scale experiments, in particular, on networks. I studied a lot of different properties of large-scale graphs, but today I'm going to focus on this problem of uh, large-scale experimentation. So how many people in the room have heard of A-B tests when you're running a, most hands up? Okay, so A-B tests are the modern kind of web version of randomized trials. So you're a large retailer and you're having this debate over what color to make your buy button. Should you make it yellow or green? And so you, what you do is you run a large scale randomized trial where you take all of the visitors to your website as they're arriving. And for every person who's arriving, you flip a coin. And then you ask some people I'm going to assign to treatment and some people I'm going to assign to control on the standard sort of randomized trial framework. And you call these treatment A and B. And so you do this, and some people get the green buy button, and some people get the yellow buy button, and then you're looking at sort of what the purchasing levels of the different designs are, and you're trying to make a data-driven decision as to which of these two layouts is the more performative for your business needs. Very, very standard practice in modern uh, web design. So uh, the problem that I study is a related problem of running these types of experiments, in particular on social networks. So <clears throat> what makes the problem very different on social networks is that if you go out on a social network and look at all the users, uh, you actually have this very basic assumption that underlies large-scale randomized, or any randomized trial, which is an independence assumption between the people that are receiving the treatment. So when you go out, if you're, if you're a company like Facebook, and you go out and you want to change the design of the website for your users, you want to add a product, you go out and you flip a coin, and let's say that you give a video chat product to half of the users on the site, and you want to understand what is the effect on the users of this video chat product. You now have this problem where some of these people, you're trying to understand how much the video chat product changed their experience, but they don't actually have anyone to talk to. Right? So it's very hard to measure the effects of video chat if you don't have anybody to talk to. So uh, this is a widespread problem, uh, the most general version of which is sort of this fundamental problem of causal inference, which is that there's actually two universes that you want to compare. You want to compare the world you know, that where you haven't made any interventions, any changes, to the world where everybody has this other product. And those are kind of the counterfactual universes that you're trying to observe. And the advantage of, or in ordinary A-B testing, you're able to sort of simultaneously get observations from both of these worlds. You're able to just give a person a green buy button or a yellow buy button, and you kind of get the observations in parallel. But the problem is on networks, you can't get the sort of an observation from that world and this other world at the same time in order to understand what would the actual effects of changing of your major product change that you want to launch be. So this problem has started to receive a lot of attention in the last few years. It's sort of at the intersection of computational methods, uh, large-scale sort of large-scale statistics, uh, and um, these are some of the references. There's references on the slides that will be going online. Um, there's also nuances to this question, right? So you might actually be interested in what is the effect of a product change only on an individual? And what is sort of the only the indirect effect if you give everybody else a product change <coughs> except the person? Yes. And you don't necessarily have to be interested in the extreme, just the extreme corners of nobody and everybody. You might be interested in some decomposition to direct and indirect effects. So this is a widespread problem that's not just like a Facebook problem. Uh, so if you're any type of communication service, if you're uh, a cell phone provider, you're trying to understand what's the effect of your pricing plan on your, on your customer engagement. Uh, any, the design of any modern web platform like Kickstarter, how do you sort of make things go viral, in quotes. Uh, Spotify, a lot of user engagement is driven through uh, social engagement. So if you change the product for one person, it's actually going to affect how the other, the, the friends of that person engage with the product. Uh, modern online markets like ad markets, labor markets, Airbnb, et cetera. On Airbnb, if you change the product, uh, the, the web layout, so that uh, it increases the purchase of certain, of certain uh, hotel rooms or bedrooms, uh, it actually will disappear from the inventory of the control condition. So you have this tunneling from treatment to control that you need to uh, characterize and sort of understand. Uh, and then uh, the problem that I worked on previously, which is this problem of if you change newsfeed at a company like Facebook or ranking algorithms at a place like Twitter, that actually has not just effects on the people receiving the treatment, but also the, the sort of the network neighbors of the people receiving the treatment. So you have this strong spillover effect. So 
how can we test for network effects uh, in these types of setups? And sort of, there's lots of theory of network effects, sort of lots of uh, economic models of ex positive externalities, etc. cetera. Uh, what, what can we actually do in practice to try and understand when they're there, when they're not, rather than just kind of speculating about their presence? So the, the widespread solution to this problem in industry and sort of web industry is the New Zealand approach, which is that you launch the product in New Zealand. Because New Zealand down here, there's actually a pretty good graph cut around New Zealand. Uh, it's English speaking, so you don't have to translate your product to another language. Uh, it's small, so you don't have to immediately deal with issues of scale. And you can kind of view New Zealand as sort of the, the, the control to the rest, or the, the treatment to the rest of the world's control, and try to understand how the, the network effects engage there. So this isn't just a joke. This is actually Facebook launched Timeline in New Zealand. Uh, LinkedIn used launched endorsement in New Zealand. Bookings.com launched a, their web app in New Zealand. So if you want to experience the future of the web, you should go visit New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> but side note, I've also heard that other countries also do get used. So, um, so how do we get beyond the New Zealand approach is something that I've worked a lot on. So this question of can we divide up graphs, this is really just a graph of a bunch of interferences, can we divide that graph up in a more principled manner than just picking countries where we're actually wrestling against this factor that New Zealand users use the website differently than other users. So can we view this as a large scale partitioning problem? So this is a problem that I've worked on a lot, uh, in part in collaboration with folks at Facebook on designing these really, really scalable methods for large scale graph partitioning. Uh, some of these methods include things like using, uh, using label propagation methods and adapting them to satisfy balance constraints, uh, streaming methods, and then also some theory for specifically for this experimentation problem. Uh, there's actually a really cool paper just out by an engineering crew uh, at Facebook that I collaborated before, their uh, social hash paper that just came out at NSDI, which is about how they're now actually using these uh, sort of basically uh, something like a partitioning regime to distribute how they're storing all of their data uh, in all their data centers so that they're increasing the co-locality co between uh, users that are friends. Um, the problem that I worked on initially was how to uh, distribute the recommendation system for the people you know in on Facebook where you're trying to recommend users. Uh, and that problem was actually what, that was actually working on that problem was what got me into this experimentation problem where you have these, uh, these problems like you want to run a large scale treatment on, on a graph. And if you've thought, if you've taken any class in graph partitioning or anything like that, you sort of have a first order answer to this question, which is a much better way to study treatment control would be to look for a good graph cut and then give half of the graph the treatment and half the graph control. And now you're actually going to be able to sort of partially observe this part of the network under sort of network treatment and partially observe this part of the network under network control. So now you can sort of start to try and get an observation uh, from both sides, but this is actually uh, an imperfect method. Sort of, I said it's like the first order, sort of the true first approximation method. Uh, so <coughs> the, first, the first step beyond that is to start looking at the fact that uh, there are certain people in the network that are much more likely to get kind of surrounded by this product than others, right? So low degree users on the periphery of the graph are going to be the first ones to really be surrounded under any type of partitioning regime. And so you really need to start thinking about the fact that now if you go and study the treatment effect on people who were surrounded by your method, you're introducing a bias where you're mostly measuring the behavior of people who are, have very few friends. So you'd be making a product decision based on the least engaged users. So that's a bad idea. Uh, so the short answer is that you can correct for that bias by, by calculating the probability of being surrounded under the clustering algorithm. Uh, in general, there's this pipeline that I like to think about, which is that you kind of you have a graph and you're trying to design some kind of experiment for it for the, that there's, uh, in response to which you're expecting some kind of behavior, and then you want to somehow measure the effect of that intervention. And actually, the, the full loop of this problem is that you can design to minimize the variance of your analysis. So you can actually set it up as a, a design problem where you have a variance that you're trying to minimize over your choice of how you're going to cluster the graph. And that's sort of either you have actual, uh, you know something about, you're either setting a model of the behavior or you're, you have historical data of how people are behaving and you have your, your variances under various behaviors, or you're assuming some kind of homogeneity assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so how do you design these experiments, uh, sort of design your randomization schemes to minimize your variance is a problem that I think about a lot for different versions of this problem. Uh, the basic approach then I was describing is this idea that you chop up the graph into graph clusters and you run your randomization at a cluster level. Uh, there's nodes around, basically you're trying to account for the node's probability of network exposure and you're sort of flipping these coins at the cluster level. And you're looking at somebody who, you know, some people, someone landed with most of their friends on one cluster and some friends on another, and then they, you can figure out what their probability, in this case, just like what's their probability of being completely surrounded, you can figure that out. If you're trying to say what's their probability of being 90% surrounded, that turns out to be this simple dynamic programming exercise that you can kind of uh, catch your own tail on uh, successfully. Uh, so this has also then been employed at a bunch of other companies, not just in my collaborations with Facebook. LinkedIn used this, and they've been studying sort of the problems they've run into when they cluster their graph. They get very, very different sizes of their clusters. Uh, so this is the x-axis here is the clusters in the LinkedIn social network that they're clustering, and the y-axis is the log scale of the cluster size. So these are very, very different sized clusters using some of these methods. Uh, which highlights the importance of using uh, basically constrained partitioning methods. So you want to create similarly sized networks, uh, uh, clusters when you run these treatments on networks. Um, you have more general balancing needs too that I won't go into, but basically uh, if you find a really good graph chart in the United States, you've probably found the Mississippi River. Uh, and now you're going to have this problem that half of your users are very far from your data center, which is probably located in California. Uh, so you have to account for the fact that you have differences in the access times and you know, are you causing bias from that? So you actually want to do some kind of matching uh, in a broader attribute space which connects to sort of propensity score matching techniques and other sort of matching methods from statistics. Uh, so the, the high level takeaway uh, from the work that I've been doing here is that there's lots of opportunities for developing statistical methods for networks, in particular for uh, experiments. So uh, experimental design, how do you sort of wonder, wonder is this, this optimization problem of minimizing variance tractable? Uh, sort of analysis, what are the virus reduction techniques, all the, the kitchen sink of methods, winds arising, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Stratified uh, partitioning or block experiments, how do you how do you minimize, is that sort of a variance reduction technique? Matching, how do you match on graphs? Uh, sort of find two similar people with respect to some uh, structural question. And uh, very broadly, I just see this as like a huge research opportunity, so I'm super interested in discussing it with anybody who also finds this interesting. Thank you. Thank you.